Bueno, bienvenidos a todos. Esto es una ocasión especial de los, las, los Atenidos y Conferencias de la Fundación Zambrano. Hoy es muy especial porque está de nuevo con nosotros el profesor Jaire, que es conocido por todos por sus trabajos en vasculopatías oclusivas, sobre todo, pero en muchísimas áreas de oftalmología diversas. Y en este caso nos va a hablar de otro de los tops de su, de su producción, que es eh, la neuropatía óptica anterior isquémica. Eh, y bueno, vamos a contar con, también con la presencia del profesor Roberto Ebner y de la doctora Dolores Rivero Ayerza, que son expertos en el área y conocidos por todos ustedes y amigos de la casa. Les hablo un poquito del profesor Jaire, para quienes no lo conocen, eh, no, no conocen tanto su producción, él nació en la India, se formó ahí, eh, tuvo un, uno de sus primeros trabajos fue refutar la, eh, la arteria central del nervio óptico que había su, sido publicada por otro oftalmólogo, François, él lo refutó, después hizo un fellow con Duke Elder en Londres, hizo sus estudios con monoresus sobre eh, vasculopatías eh, de todo tipo en Edimburgo, y luego empezó a trabajar en la Universidad de Iowa, donde hizo todos sus, sus últimos trabajos sobre pacientes de historia natural de patologías vasculopa eh, de vasculopatías oclusivas. Así que, bueno, es todo un honor tener a tal referente de la oftalmología hoy con nosotros. Eh, Profesor Harry, thank you for being with us today. It's an honor as always, and uh, it's a sign of great generosity of you to, to show you, uh, to show us uh, the, the production that you have and the thoughts that you have on, on your investigations that you have run uh, all of your life. Thank you for that. And, <clears throat> you know, this is not the first time I've been talking to people in Argentina. I visited Buenos Aires twice in the past. And then last time on the lecture on central vein occlusion <clears throat> in 1982, when I came to the meeting in Jules, Jules Club, Glaucoma in Cordoba. That time, some of you may remember, was the day when I was in Cordoba, your Falkland War started. So that was about 40 years ago. Some of you may not be old enough at that time to know that. And then in 1992, I was invited as a guest speaker at the Argentinian Ophthalmological Society. So I, 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 I loved Buenos Aires. I found it a wonderful city. It reminded me of Spanish cities because I've been to Spain a number of times. So the whole place is like that. And I was asked to talk on anterior ischemic of the neuropathy. Now, the terminology used for anterior ischemic of the neuropathy has been given different names by various authors because of the controversy about their pathogenesis. In 1970, based on my study, I gave it the name anterior ischemic of the neuropathy because it involves the anterior part of the optic nerve and it is an ischemic disorder. So that's why I called it anterior ischemic of the neuropathy. Now, if you look at the blood supply of the optic nerve, based on the optic nerve, we can divide optic nerve into two regions. Anterior part, which is supplied by the posterior arteries, and the posterior part, 
which is not supplied by Porcius Triaci. This is a big difference, but it is supplied by multiple other branches. What does Posteriority supply in the optic nerve head? If you look at this, this sclera, choroid, and the retina, and this is lamina brother. So the Posteriority supplies the pre-laminar region, lamina brother, and immediate retrolaminar region, but it does not supply the surface layer of the optic nerve. And that is supplied by the retinal circulation. So this is important when dealing with the blood supply of the optic nerve and measuring it. So based on that, we can divide the ischemic optic neuropathies into two types. Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy due to ischemia of the anterior part. Posterior ischemic optinopathy due to ischemia of the posterior part. So for the first time, I describe both these entities. Anterior ischemic optinopathy is usually abbreviated as AIL. It's an ischemic disorder of the posterior as you can imagine because that part of the optic nerve is supplied by posterior artery. Where the posterior part of the optic nerve is not supplied by posterior artery. So that is a big difference. Therefore, pathogenetically and clinically, anterior ischemic and posterior ischemic optic neuropathies are totally different clinical entities. Sometimes people put them as one disease. They're not one disease. They're two different, typically different diseases. Let's talk about anterior ischemic optinopathy. As I said, it is abbreviated to AION. AION is one of the most prevalent visually crippling diseases in the middle age and elderly. But I have seen some young people having that so that no age is immune from getting this disease. And most importantly, it is potentially a bilateral disease. So sooner or later, the likelihood of both eyes getting involved by that. As regards the causes of AIL, Janssen arthritis is the most important cause. I'll discuss that. Other causes, diabetes, mellitus, arterial hypertension, nocturnal nausea, that means nighttime fall of blood pressure. I'll discuss that in a moment. Malignant arterial hypertension, collagen vascular diseases, massive recurrent hemorrhages, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, valvular heart disease, coronary artery disease, vasomotor disorders. Among the ocular causes, raised intraocular pressure uh, can cause that. And then marked or chronic optic disc edema. And then Finally, we have some where we cannot find any cause and it's called idiopathic. Now, as I said, Janssen arthritis is the most important thing to remember because this is an ophthalmic emergency because of the imminent danger of bilateral total blindness. That blindness is preventable. I've highlighted the by early diagnosis and urgent management. This is important to keep in mind, early diagnosis and urgent management. So we can classify AIN into two types. Arthritic AIN due to Janssen arthritis and non-arthritic AIN, which is not due to 
John Scott writer. And non arthritic AI is much more common than the arthritic AI. Now, non arthritic AI is a multifactorial disease. That means a number of risk factors combined together to produce this. Unfortunately, impression most of the time is you look for a single cause and there is no single silver bullet to cause it. So whenever you're dealing with that, you have to look at in the form, what are the various risk factors which are causing it? The various risk factors can play a role in its development. They fall into two main categories, risk factors predisposing risk factors, which make a person susceptible or vulnerable to get it. And precipitating risk factor, if a person has these, then something comes up, risk factor, which finally brings it on. And I've discussed that detail in this paper. So on my slide at the bottom, I'll give a reference for those who want to have more information. Now, what are the predisposing risk factors? I divide that into two categories, systemic risk factor and the local risk factor. Systemic risk factors I've just mentioned, diabetes, hypertension, hypertension, atherosclerosis, aging, ischemic heart disease, blood loss, and so many other causes, which I just mentioned. Among the local factors in the optic nerve, poor blood supply to the optic nerve head. Since this part is supplied by posterior artery, so a disease of the posterior artery can cause that. Vasospasm, defective optic nerve head autoregulation, raised intraocular pressure, chronic optic disc edema, and other causes. And this is important to know when you're dealing with this disease and trying to find out what caused it. Most of the time, neuro-ophthalmologists don't ask, when did it, do you notice that you lost your vision? This is most important factor determining what causes it. In this study, in 544 cases, 73% said they discovered the visual loss on waking up in the morning or first time awakening from sleep or nap and that first opportunity to use the vision after sleeping because every time you wake up, you don't notice immediately. But when you start working, then you, for the first time, you notice, oh, you're not seeing very well. But that occurred actually during the night. And most of the remaining patients were not sure of the time when it occurred. That means 73% were definite. 27% they said they, don't, they didn't know. Most likely, the incidence is much higher than 73%, maybe in high 90s. Why this thing happen during the night? During, so naturally, the one had to answer this question, what happens during sleep? There's a fall of blood pressure in all of us during sleep. To investigate that, I did a 24-hour embryology blood pressure monitoring study to every 10 minutes recording blood pressure in more than 700 patients. And this is discussed at length in this paper. Here is a graph of every 10 minutes plotting in a patient starting about 11 o'clock going on 
till 10 o'clock the next day. The upper daughter line is usually normal, the highest systolic pressure, normal, and the lowest one is the diastolic blood pressure. So if you look at it, during the day, the blood pressure is uh, normal. And the moment, about 10 o'clock or so, the patient went to sleep, there is the blood pressure drops like a stone and it remains low during sleep. And when the morning the patient woke up, the blood pressure went up. So this is called nocturnal arterial hypotension. And this happens in everybody. More and more in some patients and less in other patients. The importance of this is that we measure blood pressure during the day. But daytime blood pressure is not a guide to what happened during sleep. Here it is. There's a, about 40 day millimeter mercury fall of blood pressure when you go to sleep. So nocturnal arterial hypotension seems to be most important precipitating risk factor in susceptible persons. That is the bottom line. The nocturnal fall of blood pressure in person who is normal and no risk factor does not do any harm. But if a person who has other risk factors, this fall acts as the last straw to break the camel's back. Most common cause of marked nocturnal artery hypertension is progressive, aggressive antihypertensive therapy with beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, and this trazosan hydrochloride. This one is given to a patient with a large prostate. And usually it is given in the evening. And this produces fall of blood pressure. And the, then the use of other hypertensive drugs, like anti-iPhone, even anti-depression drugs, cause that and especially when they are given at bedtime. Because this is, if let us say, during the day, this is the blood pressure. During sleep, it falls here. And if you give any medicine here, it's going to fall way down. And that's why it is the bedtime or evening coincide with the fall of blood pressure during sleep. And that really produces abnormal fall of blood pressure. And that causes poor circulation in the optic nerve head. That results in the development of non arthritic anterior schemes of the neuropathy. Now, erectile dysfunction drugs, these are drugs which are often advised by the people for people who are erectile dysfunction. Viagra is the most common of these, and other erectile dysfunction drugs produce fall of blood pressure, all of them. And they are taken at bedtime. And that causes the AIN in person otherwise predisposed to risk factor. I discussed that in this one. So I, I had big trouble with Pfizer company, the manufacturer of Pfizer, the Viagra. And I said, Viagra produces AIR. And I've seen patients like that. Now, Verapamil is a calcium channel blocker often given for migraine. Here is a patient who was taking this morning bedtime 
and known. And these are the blood pressure recording. If you find there is almost about 50 degree or 40 degree fall of blood pressure during sleep compared to daytime. And I asked them to stop the bedtime dose. So take it morning and noon, but not take the bedtime. Then I repeated the blood pressure monitoring. You find the difference? The fall of blood pressure during the night is much less compared to when he was taking all the thing. And that can produce, yeah, and, and also it can aggravate glaucoma. And this patient was having aggravation of glaucoma. So in conclusion from all this, pathogenesis of non arthritic AI is multifactorial so that a whole host of systemic and local factors acting in different combinations predispose optic nerve to develop AI in such susceptible case, cases, precipitating risk factor act as a final instance to produce an AI. Available evidence indicates that nocturnal arterial hypotension is the most common precipitating factor. So that is the most important thing because people don't measure the blood pressure during the night and they miss the whole thing. Now it has become a cliche for the neuro-ophthalmologist I know you are a neuro-ophthalmologist hmm, to state that the pathogenesis of NAIN is not known. That is totally wrong statement. Just a second. And I have fought this, that if they say, that's the genesis of AI that is not known. Somebody trying to get hold of me on the cell phone. Don't worry, Professor. Hmm? Don't worry, <laughs> carry on, no problem. It's all right. We have, we know the passageant is aware of them. And it is very complex. But to say that it is unknown is wrong. Professor, maybe you have to take that call, I think. Hello. I'm on other line. Can you call in a couple of hours? I'm talking to people in Argentina. That was my brother who's a neurologist calling okay. me. So okay, no problem, Professor. These things can happen. Yeah. This is a modern technology. Hmm? <laughs> yes. So the message is that we know the pathogenesis. And for people to say it is not known, that means they don't understand the science behind it. Now, amiodron is used to treat ventricular arrhythmia. Therefore, they have a cardiovascular risk factor in these patients which predisposes them to develop an ARN. So that this so-called so amiodron optic neuropathy is actually ARN. And this is a wrong diagnosis. They are the people who have risk factor and then they are going to get into trouble. And I discussed that in this paper. So what are the symptoms of AI? As you know, 
there's a sudden painless visual loss really discovered on waking in the morning and generally involve the inferior visual field. That is the standard. Everybody knows that a visual equity in AIL can vary from being normal to no light perception. And this is important thing to remember that a normal visual equity does not root on the air. Because many of these patients I found are missed because they have a normal vision. So the idea that when a person has a normal visual equity, how can there be anything wrong with the eye? Visual field. In this study, I found the most common visual field effect is inferior nasal defect. This is in contrast to what is all the time the neuro-ophthalmologists are saying inferior nasal altitude defect is the most common. Central scrotoma, other optic disc related visual field can occur, but the most common is the inferior nasal. Now here are the two visual fields plotted with the Goldman perimeter. In our department, we use that all the time. In, and here you find inferior nasal visual field effect. In this patient, it was inferior altitude. And most of the time, now almost everywhere, people are using the Humphrey automated 30 degree visual field plotting. And if you're looking at 30 degree, you're getting this wrong impression, which gives the impression of inferior altitude. They miss this information. And also, if the visual field passes through the fixation or spare the fixation, the visual activity is normal because visual equity is a function of this small area of fixation. So the person can have normal visual equity, maybe totally have lost the visual field all over the place. So that's why visual equity is a poor uh, parameter to evaluate optic nerve function. And so in AIN, perimetry is far more reliable than visual equity. So the careful perimetry is one of the most important investigations in the diagnosis of AI. The visual field of plotted with gold, we, as I said, we plot visual field with a Goldman perimeter, which covers all the way out. Whereas Humphrey perimeter, only 30 degree, you're missing the outward about 60 degree field. Uh, and that's where the mistaken diagnosis and even misleading interpretation of the visual field occurs. On ophthalmoscopy, as you know, initially there is optic disc edema. Now, because it is ischemic optinopathy, there is a misconception that optic disc edema would be pale. It's not pale, it's duly hyperemic. The pallor actually starts in two to three weeks. Because here, for example, of the fundus of two patients with non arthritic and disease giving up to neuropathy, you find actually this is hyperemic. It's not pale. And other very common feature is are these 
splinter hemorrhages on the disc pocket. So when you see a picture like that, that's very typical of the anterior ischemic of tenopathy. Non-arteritic. This is the non-arteritic. This is the arteritic. And I call this chunky white disc swelling. Yeah. When you look at this, you know this is giant cell arthritis. That's it. So simple, so diagnostic. And similarly here, it's a jockey white disc. You don't get that in non arthritic. Fluorescent angiography provided a very useful information. Unfortunately, neurophonologists don't do that. So they missed a lot of useful information. In non arthritic anterior scapular neuropathy, either this watershed zone between the two posterior artery, which passes through the disc, is not filling or they have a peripapillary filling defect. Whereas in arthritic ARN, because arthritic ARN, there's a collusion of posterior That is the basic lesion. And on fluorescent furnace angiography, the area supplied by the occluded posterior does not fill. And that is absolutely diagnostic. If you see that, you got the diagnosis of Janssen arthritis and arthritic anterior ischemic of, of anterior ischemic of the neuropathy. So fluorescent fundus angiography in non-arthritic anterior ischemic of the neuropathy provides important information. Initially, there's a filling defect in the optic disc, peripapillary coronary, and coronal watershed zone. In the late phase, you have this disc staining. As I said, this is not a non-specific finding because every disc edema due to any cause will have the staining. So this is not a diagnostic, it just tells you the disc has edema. So, ophthalmoscopy, initially we have optic disc edema. Six to eight weeks after the onset, disc edema resolves spontaneously because the nerve fiber dies and the disc becomes pain. So that is a classical appearance of the on ophthalmoscopy in non arthritic anterior ischemic of tenopathy. And here we have the example. You find a hyperemic swollen disc and optic atrophy three months later. Now, there's a difference in optic atrophy in the two types of ARN. A non arthritic ARN is just pale. Either whole disc is pale or a part of the disc is pale. In arthritic ARN, the disc develops cupping. And that's where these people get misdiagnosed to have glaucoma. Because non arthritic ARN does not develop cupping. Arthritic ARN develops cupping. So in a summary of what I have been saying so far, let's recapitulate. Symptom, sudden painless visual loss discovered on waking up in the morning. Visual acuity varies from normal to no light perception. Visual field Inferior nasal is the most common. Other inferior altitudinal center scroma or other optic disc related, optic nerve related visual field effect. 
on ophthalmoscopy initially optic disc edema six to eight weeks later disc edema resolved lead to generalized or segmental optic atrophy so that i have written again and again that the diagnosis of ARN is the simplest diagnosis and yet people miss it all the time and confuse with other conditions. In the differential diagnosis, therefore, in the middle age or elderly person with optic disc related visual field effect and unilateral or bilateral optic disc edema or disc edema in one and optic atrophy in the other or unilateral or bilateral optic atrophy first thing is to rule out the eye. That is the golden principle, not to miss air. As regards the systemic evaluation of air, in the vast majority, there are no apparent neurological or systemic abnormality, apart from some age-later cardiovascular changes. I get patients all the time who have seen neurologists and neuroophthalmologists. They come loaded with MRI or CTs. I don't look at them even because that is total waste of money. Because the whole thing is so straightforward. They don't need MRI and they don't need CTs because there is no nothing wrong with the brain in these cases. The diagnosis is straightforward. Now giant cell artery is the most important in persons 55 or older. I investigated a large series of giant cell arthritis patients and the younger patients, youngest patients in my about 300 patients with giant cell arthritis was 55 years old. Then, as I said previously, fall of blood pressure during the night is a very important risk factor and playing a very important role in the development of NAIN. Diabetic get non AIN more often than non diabetic. And they have a very typical fundus appearance. For example, here, if you look at it, there are a lot of blood vessels on the surface, and they get more than normal disc hemorrhages. And in about three, four months' time, all this disappears but leaves the disc pain without doing anything. This is the natural history. They present like that and it automatically clear without any treatment. Although here, a young diabetic see those tons of these vessels they get diagnosis at neovas, optic disc neovascularization, but that's not that. And the same eye, three months later, all that has disappeared without doing anything. And here is another example. During the acute phase, the swelling of the disc, abnormal vessels, and lot of hemorrhages. And then the, it's for the upper part of the disc which was involved. So that has become pain. And the rest of the hemorrhages are much less and they will disappear. This is two months later, in about three, four months, the, all these hemorrhages will do that. And this is a very typical appearance of the patient or eyes with 
non arteritic ion in diabetics. Now, anion in diabetics are wrongly called diabetic papillopathy. And you will find this term using all the time. So that as if diabetic papillopathy is a different disease. But actually, this is non arteritic ion because this clinical presentation is different. It's not a different clinical entity. Now, in the management of diabetic anion, they get misleadingly diagnosed having proliferative diabetic retinopathy because there are those multiple vessels on the surface. They get misdiagnosed as optic disc neovascularization and there are hemorrhages. And then what happens? Retina people immediately do the PRP, parenteral photocoagulation. Now, this, as I showed you, there's a spontaneous resolution of the optic disc lima, peel injectory vessel, retinal hemorrhages, and they, and the retina people say, look, I did the PRP, and those hemorrhages disappeared. They would have gone even norm, normally. In fact, and they say this is the beneficial effect of PRP. In fact, PRP is harmful in these eyes. And so I just first described this in 1981, then discovered a, described a large series in 2008. Now there's a, another type of hair, NAI, which is called the incipient. That means these patients with AN do not have any symptom at all to begin with. They're asymptomatic. At this stage, only thing they have is optic disc edema. There's no subjective or objective visual loss. And they get misdiagnosed as due to the raised intracranial pressure or other causes of optic disc edema. I first described this entity in 1981. And now in 20, 2008, I described a large series of these cases. Although here is a patient with incipient non arteritic AI. You find the disc edema, fluorescent fundus angiography, that part is steady. But this patient did not have any visual symptoms. As a rule, I examine both discs when a patient comes. This patient had previously an AON in his left eye. So when I looked into the right eye, that's what I found. I asked him if he was feeling anything. No, we did the visual field, no visual field, no, nothing of the sort. This was the only finding. And three weeks later, he woke up with loss of vision. And so this diagnosis <clears throat> is missed very often because people are looking for visual loss. Other thing which is important is a cup disc ratio, which a lot of stress is laid down about this in NAON. Typically, I with NAON have either no cup at all or a small cup. And there's a highly prevalent misconception that absence of cup causes NAI. I see that all the time. People say that their doctor said it was absence of cup which caused the development of NAI. And that is totally wrong. 
Well, small, <coughs> small cup does not, or abscess of cup, does not cause any One thing one has to remember is, and once the disc edema starts, you know, in the optic disc, there's a small place, and a million nerve fiber are passing through that. And when they swell, that produces the disc swelling. And they, if there's no cup, they press the blood vessels. And that brings on the ischemia of the optic nerve, and that produces the visual loss. If there is a cup in the center, that provides a space for the swelling to extend into it. And it does not then compress the capillaries. And that's where it does not, so the presence of cup acts as a safety mechanism when there's a disc swelling. So absence of cup simply aggravates the ischemic process. And I'll discuss that at length in this paper. Most important thing is, from the diagnostic point of view, if in one eye you have disc swelling, disc edema, and other finding of any iron, look at the other eye. If it has no cup, that adds to the diagnosis of any eye. And is typically seen in the fellow eye. Other thing I investigated was, what are the risks of the second eye getting any iron? Because as I said in the beginning, any iron is a bilateral disease, ultimately most often. So this curve gives you the information that as the time passes, more and more people are going to get in the second eye. For example, in about three years, about 25% of people will get in the second eye. So anyone usually starts as a unilateral condition, but after days, months, or years, it frequently becomes bilateral. For example, as I said, it was bilateral in about 25% in three years. Now, I'm often asked, what are my chances of getting more than one attack of ADN in the same eye? So I investigated that in this study. So an eye can have more than one episode of ADN in about six and a half percent of the eyes. So that in about three years, that is what happened. Six point three percent within three percent within three years, the same eye can get another episode. I have one patient who had more than six, seven episodes again and again and again in the same eye. Then I looked at it. Why, what is the difference between people who get again and again in the same eye versus those who don't get again? And I found that patients with recurrent and in the same eye had a significant lower mean nighttime minimum diastolic blood pressure, p-value 003, and greater percentage drop in diastolic blood pressure during sleep compared to patients without any recurrence. That means nocturnal artery hypotension is present in those cases, and that again and again produces the because if you have the 
same risk factor present and the nocturnal artery hypertension is marked occurring all the time. You are vulnerable to get more than one episode of ADHD. Next is the management of anti-ischemic neuropathy. And that is, of course, the most important. Once you're diagnosed, you want to know what to do with it. As I said, we, can, we have classified ARN into two, arthritic ARN and non-arthritic ARN. Naturally, whenever you suspect a patient has ARN, first essential is to find out, are you dealing with arthritic ARN or with non-arthritic ARN? That is the first step in the management of these patients. And I discussed that at length in this paper. What, how to do that? Very briefly, best mean or differentiated diagnosis or any one is a combination of the information for the following thing. In GCA, Johnson arthritis, they have systemic symptoms of Johnson arthritis. Non arthritic ARN do not have those symptoms. Most importantly, high ESR and C rectal protein in, is always there in Johnson arthritis, but not in non arthritic ARN. <clears throat> if a, a patient presents with massive visual loss, that means can only see hand motion or no light perception, that is very likely due to Janssen arthritis. Then as I showed you previously, chalky white optic disc lima is diagnostic of Janssen arthritis. And in Janssen arthritis, there's a posicillian eclosion that is well established. That leads to optic nerve infarction and optic disc edema. Now, ciliaretinal artery also arises from the posticillia artery. And posticillia artery supply both the disc and the ciliaretinal artery. So when you get arthritic air and ciliaretinal artery also gets involved. So if an eye presents with optic edema and ciliated artery occlusion, that is diagnostic of Janssen arthritis because they are the result of the occlusion of the posterior artery. On fluorescent fundus angiography, as I showed you, massive non-filling of the colloid in the area supplied by the occluded posterior that is again diagnostic. And so we have diagnostic feature, chalky white optic edema and presence of disc edema with ciliar artery and then fluorescent for the angiography. So actually it becomes very easy if you do all these and understand all these basic things to differentiate the two diseases. Then finally, you have to have a terminal artery biopsy. When you are in doubt about a patient having arthritic error. So the management of arthritic error, the most important step is in all patients with error older than 55 to rule out Janssen arthritis by doing ESR and c rectal protein immediately. And why to do it immediately? Because this is an emergency. Don't let your patient walk out of the clinic unless you know all this information. Patients with GCA are in danger of bilateral total blindness, which is preventable. I highlighted the preventable. 
If you diagnose early, institute the treatment immediately, you can prevent that from happening. In arthritic AI, it is well established that the only effective treatment to prevent further loss of vision is a prompt high dose systemic steroid therapy. In my study, about 500 patients, no one lost any vision five days after the start of steroid therapy. So steroid therapy is so effective. Why five days I usually compare it to if you're driving a car at 70 miles an hour, you apply the brake, car doesn't stop immediately. It takes time. So similarly, the inflammatory process takes about five days for gyal arthritis to be controlled. And the other thing is, people wait for the biopsy, temporary biopsy, to make a diagnosis. But start treatment immediately. Do not wait for the temporary biopsy, because by the time temporary biopsy comes, patient may have gone blind in the other eye. You lost the whole thing. So this is something every dear ophthalmologist has to be aware of. You're dealing with something which is so urgent that you can help it the prevent blindness. I have a lot of people who come to me with gyal arthritis and who doctor just waited and they went blind. I have patients with totally blind in both eyes, which have, could have been prevented if patient, if the ophthalmologist or the neuro-ophthalmologist has managed it properly. I've discussed that in this paper. Now, how about the management of non arthritic ischemia of the neuropathy? Briefly, these are the three types of treatment which have been advocated. Optic nerve sheath deep compression. This was advocated by this group from Wills Eye Hospital. And based on about 30 or so eyes, they said, and I quote, optic nerve sheath decompression improves visual loss due to progressive non arthritic and a disorder without any previous effective therapy. And when I saw this paper, this paper was public because it was considered such an important finding and in a disease which has no other treatment. And here they're giving this, prescribing this treatment, which helped to improve the vision. The archives of ophthalmology published on urgent basis immediately. When I read that, I found that was not the truth. So I wrote in this paper, immediately that optic nerve sheet depression in any eye has no scientific rationale and could be harmful. In spite of that, that became a worldwide popular procedure. Why? Because this was a dynamite combination. You have a that, desperate patients who have gone lost vision. And they are desperate for anything to be done. And then the optic nerve sheet decompression surgeon, they were making a lot of money. In this country, they were making anything up to 1,500 to uh, $20,000. Whenever you 
interfere with the income of people, they get mad at you. So the neuropsychologist got mad at me that there was a treatment which was working and I was saying, don't do it. And the surgeon who was making a hell of a lot of money that I was interfering with that. So finally, the National Institute of Health, which is the largest research agency in the world, funded a clinical trial. That trial had to be stopped because they found that optical sheathing pressure surgery for non arteritic ion is not effective and may be harmful. When I said five years before that, immediately after the paper was published, I spent about three to four hours writing that based on science. And the National Institute of Health spent $10 million to prove the same thing. If you know science, you can calculate the whole thing. It is the ignorance of the science which lead to all that sort of thing. And that's the most important thing. Why optimum sheet equation was harmful? Because in the study, that clinical study, visual activity improvement and optimum nerve sheet equation was about 33%. And if you didn't do anything, it was 43% improvement. So the more improvement, if you left them alone. Similarly, visual loss in eyes which had the optic nerve sheet recognition, 24% lost more vision. And those who had nothing done, 12%. So that means double of the patient lost more vision. So the visual outcome depression of optic nerve sheet recognition in patients with without, without or progressive and uh, there were no difference. So this is very important lesson to teach. The science determines what is going to be useful, what is not going to be useful. It's unfortunate that ordinary ophthalmologists and neuroophthalmologists are based more on clinical finding rather than based on science. And that may sound rude, but that's a fact. Now, systemic corticosteroid therapy. This has become the most controversial treatment at present. A small study by Professor Foles at the University of Glasgow in Scotland in 1969, and my preliminary study when I was at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland in 1972, indicated that systemic corticosteroid therapy in non arthritic AIN may improve the visual equity. So based on that information, in 1973, I planned a large multicenter randomized clinical trial to investigate systematically in a large cohort of NAI patients, whether systemic corticosteroid therapy improved the visual outcome. That clinical study was not funded by the National Institute of Health because the neuro ophthalmologists on the committee firmly believed, based on no scientific data at all, that corticosteroid therapy has no role in any way. That was 1973. So what do we have to do to find the information? Since no alternative treatment existed, I felt that it was crucial to find out whether corticosteroid therapy was actually beneficial 
ineffective or harmful. Because that was very important information. So I decided to conduct a patient choice study. So I told the patient, you have to decide whether you want to take the medicine or not take the medicine. Because I'm not guaranteeing anything at all. But that was the best choice I thought to study this whole subject. Then I specifically told all the patients that I had no idea whether treatment was beneficial, ineffective, or even harmful. So I collected the data from 1973 till 2000 in my clinic. That was a long time. So I conducted this study for 28 years in a mass fashion, not knowing who was getting it and who was not. So that was 696 patients in my clinic that in that period. I was totally surprised when I found out the 51% volunteered to take the steroid therapy, 49% said they don't want any treatment. So that means half and half took it, other half said they didn't want it. The treatment protocol was the initially 80 milligram prednisone daily for two weeks. After that, tapered down to 70 milligram for five days, 60 milligram for five days, then cut down by five milligram every five days to zero. And the study is published in this paper at length. The result was in the, I included those patients in this study who had a visual equity of equal to or better than 2070. And they were seen within two weeks of onset. And the result at six months was this visual activity improved in 70% of the teacher compared to 40% of the group without any treatment. So the odds ratio of improvement was 3.3 and highly significant difference between the two. Visual field also improved. Uh, and again, p-value is highly significant. In both treated and untreated group, the visual equity and visual field kept improving for about six months after the onset. But after six months, nothing, there was no improvement at all. Actually, I was surprised by six months because I usually used to tell patients that once the disc diva resolved, there's not going to be any further improvement. But it kept improving for six months. Now, what happened? Neuro-ophthalmologists do not accept the finding of this study. They hold the stereotherapy has no role in treatment of non arthritic iron. That was what they thought in 1973. And still, in 2000, they saw the same thing again. This is what it is. Their philosophy is, do not bother me with the facts. I have made up my mind. And once people have made up their mind, there's nothing you can do. As you see with the politicians all over the world. I've been doing research for 65 years. Based on my finding, I have often contradictory dogmas and conventional wisdom. Whenever conventional wisdom is challenged, even if the new scientific information totally contradicts the old concept, initial reaction is always skepticism or even ridicule. I have faced that for the last 65 years. 
Now, these are the four objections which are raised to my study. And let's look at each one separately. I anticipated these objections. So in our paper, we provide an answer to all these objections. But people don't want to read that. Let's look at these. First, there's no scientific rationale for the use of steroid therapy in non arthritic ailments. That's what they said in 1973 when I applied for a large study. Let's look at this. NAIN is due to ischemia of the optic nerve. Everybody agrees with that. Initially, there's an optic disclaimer, which is due to two factors axonal ischemia or hypoxia result in exoplasmic prostatal. That result in swollen axons. That produces a disc swelling. I have investigated that and have shown that. Second, capillary leak in optic nerve head. As I showed previously, in all these, when there's disc edema, there's a staining of the optic disc or fluorescent from the angiography. That happens in all NAIN discs. And that's leakage is due to ischemic and sculptory capillary. When the capillaries are subjected to ischemia, they leak. And then also the swelling of the disc in the, within the optic disc compresses the veins. That causes venous stasis. And these two they combine together lead to the leakage. So multiple studies in macroedema due to variety of causes have established that intravitreal steroid reduces capillary permeability. That reduces the fluid leakage. That reduces the edema. My study showed that those treated with steroid therapy within two weeks after the onset of anion had significantly faster optic disc edema resolution than the untreated body. And I showed that in this study. So the rationale for visual improvement with steroid therapy is this one. Faster resolution of disc edema with steroid therapy leads to faster decrease of compression of the capillaries of the optic nerve head. That lead to better blood flow in the optic capillaries, that results in improved circulation of the optic nerve. And that leads to improved function of the surviving but not functioning hypoxic axon. And that results in improved function. So you have to go understand the basic science behind it, step by step, what exactly happened. There's another rationale for the visual improvement with steroid therapy. In this study, they concluded selective inflammatory modulation also may be relevant in the, in the treatment of human non arthritic hair treatment. Steroid therapy is the treatment of choice in inflammatory disorders because that ischemia and infarction in the optic nerve uh, results in a certain amount of inflammatory process. Steroid will suppress that inflammatory process. So we have two separate mechanisms by which steroid are helping to improve the vision. Second objection was, there is no conventional randomization in this study. 
there were no significant difference between the treated and the untreated group in the baseline demographic and clinical characteristics. And that fulfilled the basic critical criteria for conventional randomization. So long as the treated and the untreated group have the same demographic clinical credency, you deliver two persons with the same kind of situation. Third, study was not collected in mass fashion and was biased. Ischemic optinopathy decompression trial, which I just mentioned, was a randomized and mass study. In that study, the visual action data for untreated eye, and in my study, untreated eye was the same, 40% in both. If there was a bias, that couldn't have happened. Could they found 40% of the untreated eye had improvement of vision spontaneously. And in this study, 40% showed improvement of vision without any treatment. So that shows that there were no bias. Fourth, the oral corticosteroid therapy in acute cerebral stroke are contraindicated. But the they forget that pathogenetically, any and a stroke are totally different clinical entities. They are not the same, etiologically and otherwise, because ischemic stroke is a thromboembolic disorder and there is severe ischemia. Any and is a hypotensive disorder, as I told you. Nocturnal artery hypertension brings it on. And there's a mild ischemia. For example, in arthritic AR, there's a severe ischemia because of the occlusion of posticiliarity. And steroid therapy does not help in arthritic AR. So the, one had to go at the basic level of size. Therefore, to equate non arthritic AI with ischemic stroke is a fundamental mistake. That's being done all the time but without understanding that the two are pathogenetically and etiologically are totally different diseases. And also, histology of brain and histology of optic nerve are different. And finally, people are giving aspirin or anticoagulant because they think in stroke, because it's a thromboembolic disorder, aspirin helps. In this study, we found no long-term benefit of aspirin in reducing the risk of non arthritic AN. Why? Aspirin benefit thromboembolic disorders. It does not affect blood pressure. It is a nocturnal hypotension, which is the culprit in non arthritic AN, and aspirin is not going to make any difference on that. So, anyone almost invariably is not a thromboembolic disorder. That's again a mistaken idea that it is a thromboembolic disorder. It is a hypotensive disorder. So that we didn't need to do this study if we just looked at size. So there's a lot of study, study which are done where you can find out the answer based on size. In non arthritic uh, patients are always told by their ophthalmologist that there is no treatment and nothing can be done. This is 
a completely wrong advice. They do need counseling, how to reduce or minimize the various risk factors for development of AIDS, because you're going to go back to the why I developed NAIN. And you have to tackle those factors which caused it in the first place to prevent any further damage. So a reduction of risk factor, to reduce risk factor of development of any eye in the other eye, or further visual loss is the same. It's essential to reduce as many risk factors as possible. This is the most important step in the management of non arthritic AI. All patients require thorough evaluation of risk factors. And as I said previously, risk factors may be systemic risk factors or maybe local risk factors. So you got to look at all, all of them. What is responsible for in the first place producing non arterial AI? Nocturnal artery hypertension, as I said, is a big risk factor. So it's important, therefore, management of nocturnal artery hypertension is an important step in prevention and management of any Okay, most I found important this on the web cause of, an important step in Trenton. Check it out. Most important cause of non-nocturnal artery hypertension is over-medication with blood pressure lowering drugs or taking them at bedtime. People don't, the ophthalmologists never ask, what drugs you are on, when are you taking? It's very seldom that anybody asks this information and this is critical information. I strongly recommend that when patient is at risk of developing non arthritic care or has a history of non arthritic care in one eye, the treating physician should be made aware of the potential risk of intensive arterial hypertensive therapy, particularly to give it in the evening or bedtime. Ordinary physician, I deal with them, they are not totally aware of that. They keep on giving more medicine and more time in patients because their whole object is to bring the blood pressure down without realizing what happens when the blood pressure falls too low. So in conclusion, regarding the management of AI, patient age 50 or more always rule out dense arthritis by doing ESR and C-reactive protein. If dense arthritis or arthritic error is suspected, it's an important ophthalmic emergency. Start steroid treatment immediately. In any hand, start systemic steroid therapy soon after its onset and continue on till resolution of optimistic edema. And most importantly, reduce risk factor because that's what is going to cause second eye involvement. Or I've discussed all this in this paper, in this book a few years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. That's what, that was a a wonderful uh, conference, and uh, I think we all learned a lot from your words. And so let's go to the questions, uh, Professor Ebner or uh, Dr. Rivero. Uh, do you have questions of your own, or you have 
or you want to pass to the questions uh, from the audience? No, it's fine. Well, uh, let me say that it was an overwhelming experience uh, having a conference in this meeting uh, for an hour or so, but given by the father of a child about the things I've been reading for almost 40 years. It is incredible. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. The lecture you have given us and the resume of the experience and how to manage and uh, treat AON. Uh, even though it's time to uh, take advantage of your presence and uh, ask some questions. I don't know about uh, Dolores if you have ones already or Julio if you have advanced one or two. Um, I would like to take advantage from what have been said, particularly regarding the natural history of Leon regarding the non-treated cases. And uh, what happened if we have to treat, considering in one hand, this is two questions in the same one, regarding the anterior chamber surgeon who had ion in his late patient operated from cataract one, two days, one or two weeks ago, and has to face the second surgery from the second eye. What's your opinion? What to do in that case? With Dolores, we have recently reviewed this uh, subject, uh, but I would like to listen from you. And then I have a question regarding uh, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, we know and we follow your advice and we live by the book of Harry and Aon, and uh, we give also, as you did, patients to choose whether they want to go on steroids or not regarding non antheritic aeon. Surprisingly to us, most of them in my practice, they do not uh, want it unless it's the second eye. For the second eye, they are ready to do anything. What do you think about two drugs? This is my uh, last question. Uh, I let, on let me and, uh, let, let me interrupt you. Okay. One, one question at a time. I, I I'll forget what are all these questions. So what is your first question? Okay, my first question is anterior chamber surgeon ask us or neuroophthalmologist what to do in order to prevent ion in the second eye of his patient who had already won in the previous surgery. Uh, you're talking of cataract surgery? Yeah. Okay. I described that way back in 1970, when I described cases of hair in, in, uh, due to cataract. You have to, I get that question asked very often that patients who are going to have surgery, cataract or heart surgery, heart, what are their risks? Patient ask me. And I tell them not to let the blood pressure fall too low. Even when during anesthesia or giving too much medication because they have a lot of pain. And that is because it is the fall of blood pressure with medication all during surgery, which is going to precipitate or produce adhesion or make it worse. Now, there's a big problem here because I remember one patient who was going to have heart valve surgery. He asked me the same. So I said, tell your surgeon not to let your blood pressure go too low or your anesthetist. And next thing, I get a call from the anesthetist. And he said, you told the patient who's going to have the surgery 
not to let your blood pressure fall down. That's simple. We can give the vasopressor drugs and they can raise the blood pressure. And I said, you know, what is the mechanism of the vasopressor drugs causing raised blood pressure? He didn't know because what happened, they gave the vasoconstrictor. Vasoconstrictor cause constriction of the terminal arteriole. It is the terminal arteriole which regulates the blood pressure. Because once the terminal arteriole constrict, before that, the blood pressure goes high. But once the terminal arteriole are constricted, beyond that, the blood pressure gets low. And what matters is the blood flow in the capillaries. So actually, the vasoconstriction, constriction of terminal arteriole, reduces the blood flow in the capillaries, make the situation worse. And he said, oh, he never thought of that. And that is a problem because unfortunately, we don't have any mechanism where you can raise the blood pressure without the constriction of the terminal arteriole. And people do that by raising the fluid level. And for example, in patient who got spinal surgery, I got patients who were coming with posterior ischemic neuropathy. Why? Because the fight, they, there's a lot of bleeding going on in patients with spinal surgery. And they gave a lot of saline to maintain the volume. That causes hemodilution. That lowers the oxygen level. So this is a difficult situation. And the only thing which I say is have the minimum sedation. And once you've got minimum sedation, the likelihood of fall of blood pressure is less than otherwise. And it's a difficult situation. So in all the patients who have cataract, because after all, anyone are older people. And I tell them to tell their surgeon to make sure, first take care of all the big risk factors before doing surgery. And then during surgery, try to minimize giving uh, the various blood pressure lowering medicines. That means putting them, putting them under sedation, deep sedation. So those are the things, but this is a very difficult situation because the basic thing- Excuse me, Professor, there is a problem with your microphone. We cannot uh, hear you the, the, the last 10 seconds. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Do I was having my hand in? Just the last 10 seconds. It went out <laughs> very well before. Well, that is a problem I get asked all the time. And my, this is my answer. And unfortunately, general surgeon, anesthesia people are not aware. They think it's very simple to raise the blood pressure by giving vasopressor drugs without realizing that it is beyond the terminal arterial, actually you're doing more harm. Even the neurophologist, you know, Neil Miller, who is well known and is a big guy in neuroophthalmology. A good friend of us. Neil Miller, huh? 
from uh, uh, Baltimore, he said, oh, we can do this. I put him the same question. How does vasopressor things are going to cause raise of blood pressure? He said very easily, oh, they raise it. I said, but you, what is the mechanism? He didn't know the mechanism. I said, they act on the terminal arterial by causing vasoconstriction. And that is how, because blood pressure level is determined by the terminal arterial. And, but the people forget that there is a paradoxical mechanism because once the terminal arterioles are constricted, on one end, you have a high blood pressure. On the other end, nothing is going there. And don't understand that. So that is a, word, that's a big problem. And it's not, so you can only do minimize the risk of fall of blood pressure or minimize the risk factor because I wrote on the posterior ischemic of neuropathy development on spinal surgery that people who go to spinal surgery first is to find out what is the general health, cardiovascular, diabetes, and other factors, and you have to take care of that because surgeons are interested in going and doing the surgery, not considering the patient. First, you have to see what kind of patient you're dealing with. So that is a brief answer. As I say, I deal with that all the time. Okay. Give next. us another. What? Give us another short answer. <laughs> what do you uh, think about drugs like idevenone or memantine in the acute phase of ion, non-arteritic ion? If you have any, uh, uh, I, I'm thing to of, say. I'm a bit hard of hearing. So, what drugs do you say? Idebenone, which is used in labor's disease, which helps the respiratory chain of the mitochondria when the uh, oxidative stress occurs, that also occurs in ischemia and uh, may help the acidotic stress in the very first moments. Uh, this could be one uh, of the possibilities uh, of action in the pharmaceutical point of view uh, in an ischemic acute phase. And also memantine, which is uh, a drug who avoids cytotoxicity when uh, uh, dying uh, areas are uh, producing uh, the uh, toxicity of the still living, uh, non-compromised, nor ischemically insulted areas that could be saved also in the acute phase. I, I don't know, because Trazodone is more prostate and large then. And I tell them, in fact, only yesterday, one of my patients said, this doctor put me on that. And I said, you have to be careful, make sure when your blood pressure doesn't go too low. And the other drug, I don't understand what it is because it's not here. It may be an Argentina name, but we don't, I never heard of that. Okay, Dolly, do you have a question? Yes, thank you for your excellent conference. It's been uh, overwhelming. I have a few questions regarding non arteritic aon, and what do you think about the role of, of obstructive sleep apnea in the pathogenesis of this disease? Yeah, actually, I first pointed out that sleep apnea 
can be a risk factor way back. And since then, there are several studies that have come on. And I, got, I have several patients with apnea, not only with ischemic optineopathy, but even with other vascular disorders. So in them, we have a very, very good sleep center in our university. And I've discussed with the in, director of the sleep study, you have to have a CPAP. CPAP is the only answer to use that because I found, I asked patient to go on CPAP and on doing that, they come back and they say, they feel much better because they can sleep more, they're more alert and that way, the only answer is CPAP and no other answer. And CPAP works and works wonderfully. Thank you. And another question about AON, not of the RITIC, is uh, do you ha have you treated patients with steroids after two weeks of the initiation of the, of the ischemic event? Yes, there are some patients were on that, but we didn't analyze the data because you had to again look at science. The science is the axon which are subjected to ischemia. The longer they last, ischemia lasts, more damage they're going to do. I usually compare it to like a person who is starving. If after some time, the starving person don't have the strength to do any work, but is not dead. And if the starvation goes on, he dies. And then you try to put food on his mouth, he's not going to live. So same is with the exon. The exon which are ischemic, if you feed them oxygen early on, then they have a chance of recovery. If maybe also it depends for the severity of ischemia, because in the study, only 70% improved, 30% didn't improve, because in the 30%, the chances are the ischemia was so severe that mm. they were dead. And you can't, you can keep on feeding a dead person, he's not going to come alive. So similarly, for example, in the athletic area, axons are dead right from the beginning. That's why steroids don't help with them at all. So it depends upon the okay. severity of ischemia. Mild ischemia, if people would recover, if they start having a better circulation. Whereas with the severe ischemia, they're dead right from the beginning. And so I usually give an example of a man who is starving, how long he can go and start working again. And if they are starving and nobody feeds them for a long time, they die. And then you say, this is what most of the government do. People are hungry. They say, we'll come in six months and feed you. In six months, they're all dead. They don't <laughs> need it. So it's the same mechanism. Very clear. Thank you. <laughs> and what, uh, what about... Re uh, interesting to re-emphasize the window of opportunity uh, for you is two weeks. Two weeks was arbitrarily we detected that. We didn't, we could have done one week or we could have done longer. 
but we thought we used two weeks because we don't have the definite information how long axon can survive with different kind of a severity of ischemia because we have no way of judging the severity of ischemia in an air. That is the problem. We, if we had a test which would tell us whether the axon are still alive but not functioning or the axons are dead. It's only the surviving axons which are not working, they can, survive, they can start working again. But dead axons are not going to start working again. So we don't have any test to determine the severity of ischemia. So we just picked up two weeks at random because what happened, the optic, that optic nerve sheet decompression, they used two weeks. So I said, okay, I'll use two weeks as a criterion so that we have something to compare. In that study, the two weeks, what happened, the 40% recovered without any treatment. So similarly, in my study, in two weeks, without any treatment, 40% recovered. So it was the same result at two weeks. But you could you pick up any time. So whether a person who is starting at three weeks but has mild ischemia would improve, or a person at two weeks has very severe ischemia, the exon is dead. Is not going to improve. Okay. Professor, uh, professor uh, just one question for myself, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll go to the questions from the auditory. Um, do you have any thought about the use of anti-VGF? Uh, medication, uh, intravitreal medication to reduce optic disc edema, maybe in those, you, you've already explained that, uh, th those so-called diabetic. diabetic papillopathies that you told us that it's a wrong concept, but do you have any thoughts about the use of that medication to reduce uh, optic disc edema? I didn't understand what drugs were you using. Uh, Anti-VEGF, anti Bevazizumab, Aflivercept, or Ranibizumab. I, I don't know anything about that. Okay, okay. Because okay, is, so. in different countries, the drug... Uh, Ava Avastin, Lucentis, or... Uh, Avastin. Yeah. Avastin is... No, because Avastin is uh, used for the, I know this is Avastin and other anti-VEGF drugs. They are used and advocated for various things, but I don't think anti vegf is used for edema, macroedema. anti vegf has been tried in anti ischemic optic neuropathy. There were a few cases. The problem is anti ischemic optic neuropathy is ischemic. Now you have to go back to science blood flow of the optic nerve head is equal to blood pressure minus intraocular pressure. When you inject into the vitreous or any of the anti vegf or steroid, that raises the intraocular pressure. 
and the blood pressure remain the same so that the perfusion pressure falls. And that will do more damage to an optic nerve head, which is already skimming. So that's why the anti therapy, few patients, they tried and it, the eye got worse because you can go back to again, basic size. What determines the blood flow? Blood flow is determined by the difference between the blood pressure, particularly the diastolic blood pressure, minus the intraoperative pressure. You can either lower the blood pressure or you can raise the intraocular pressure. They will reduce the blood flow. So that is a very simple way of calculating. So when you inject anything in the vitreous, the intraocular pressure goes up but the blood pressure may be the same, and that does more damage to an optic nerve head, which is already skimming. Okay, and, and this, uh, this same concept may apply to cataract surgery when the surgeon has to raise the intraocular pressure in order to extract the, the cataract. So maybe it, it could be a, a um, a good advice to uh, have a minor uh, intraocular pressure rises in the in the cataract surgery context. That's very important. Do you agree with that? Because I, I, the blood flow in patients who have a cardiovascular disorder, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, yeah. there is a, a poor blood circulation and you don't want to further worsen the, the blood flow. Yes, thank you, Professor. So uh, we'll go to the uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Professor Ebner, uh, here in the, in the Zoom chat, do you see anything that you want to, to transmit to the professor? No, there was a question from Guillermo Marroquin de Colombia that uh, Dolores has already addressed. So I don't see any other comments uh, by okay. now. Okay, uh, I'll transmit just one from the Facebook chat. Um, in the patients that you've mentioned that had uh, more than one episode in, uh, in, I, um, in AION, in the, in the same eye, do you, have you found any other risk factor other than the diastolic blood pressure that could explain the preference for that particular eye? Or um, We don't have any because it was the nocturnal arterial blood pressure fall, which was causing. And I've been asked, as I said, I've done in 700 patients. I've every, every time been asked, how do I prevent the fall of blood pressure during the night? I don't have an answer because only thing is if they are taking blood pressure medicine, then I say, cut down on those and what time you take it, don't take it in the evening or bud time. Those are the type of precautions, but otherwise, we don't have any because, for example, in patients with orthostatic hypotension, they have advocated giving steroid. But then steroid long term, this is a lifelong thing. And that has side effects for long term therapy. And it's not really practical solution. So actually, we don't have an answer. What, how to prevent nocturnal artery hypotension? So you try to find out what is causing it, medication or other thing, and that's where limited. But the problem is, as I said, we don't have a definite answer. And I have been asked that question thousands of times. And I wish I had an answer. I would be a billionaire. 
Okay, thank you, Professor. The, There's person... another question here from uh, Aide okay. Martinez. She uh, asks if hematological factors in young patients, non-diabetic ones, do you consider them relevant as a risk factor like hyperhomocysteine? This is the question. You know, I have a hard of hearing, so talk slowly. I didn't understand. The question is, if you consider a relevant risk factor in young patients, the hyper homocysteinemia. That's a risk. You have to risk, as I said, reduce the risk factor because obesity is a risk factor. And obesity, weak people have usually hyperlipidemia, yeah, particularly the, uh, the LDL, low density type of protein. And that is what causes the atherosclerosis. So you have to hook into those to reduce because hyperlipidemia or atherosclerosis is a big risk factor for developing AIM. Okay, thank you, Doctor. We have a, another question from a, from Aide Martinez. Uh, she, she asks you about the relevance of color Doppler of temporal artery in um, Giants, uh, giant arteritis, giant cell arteritis. Giant cell arteritis. Yeah. But as I said, the I have published a lot on giant cell arteritis, and in giant cell arteritis, definite diagnosis lies with the temporal artery biopsy, and the type of temporal artery biopsy is very important because it should be at least one inch long piece. And then examined by doing serial section. If you cut one section or two sections, because there can be, that can give you wrong information. For example, in one patient of mine, they cut 300 sections only one section showed positive results. So that the, what is called the skip area, uh, so to have the correct results from the biopsy, you should have the long enough biopsy and done serial section, not just one or two sections. And then in my study, I found that if there was a strong suggestion of Janssen arthritis based on the symptoms and other, and one side was negative, I did the second side. And second side in some of them was positive when one side was negative. I don't advise people doing biopsy on both sides at the same time. For the one the Mayo Clinic people, they did that all. That's a dangerous procedure. This, but it's only you do the second side if you have a patient have a, all the strong symptoms of Johnson arthritis, or you have arthritic and with the cruciate of posterior artery, then you should do that. So. We did it in a few cases, and they showed a positive biopsy. On the other side, negative biopsy on one side. I have a, another question from Dr. Emily Karam from Venezuela, and she's asking about diabetic patients and the use of, cord of, of steroids. Do you use the same regimen of steroids in diabetics with non-arteritic AION? 
Yeah, that's important because I face that problem all the time. I have that the in the paper you'll find I have a large number of diabetics with AI and I discuss it with them the idea of treating with steroid. And I talked to our endocrinology professor and I said, what do I do with them? They are diabetic and they have AI and I want to treat them. They said, you can treat and let the diabetic physician or the doctor manage the uh, blood sugar when they are on high dose prednisone by increasing insulin. For example, even to the extent, my younger brother who just called me, he was he's a neurologist about three, two months ago, he developed giant cell arthritis. And he had a incipient of diabetes. And when he was started on steroid, his blood sugar went very high. He got all upset. And I said, you have to talk to your doctor. And he started on high doses of insulin, controlled his diabetes and blood sugar, but he went on taking the prednisone and gradually taper. So the question is, whenever I see a diabetic patient with anterior ischemic optinopathy and I want to treat, I tell them it has to be managed by two persons. I'll manage your uh, anterior ischemic optinopathy and your doctor has to manage your diabetes. Between the two of us, we can manage. There's no problem because I've had this thing. The only thing is the insulin or other treatment has to be increased. The treatment with steroid in NAI is for about two months. For those two months, people, the physician can control the diabetes. And I've had no problem. Okay, Thank so you. And is there another only, question? Only or? one. Only one. Yes, okay. from doc, Dr. Fernandez Sasso wants to ask, uh, how, for how long do you treat arteritic patients? Is it two years or is it longer with steroids? For the rest of their life. <laughs> I have, I dwell, I was diagnosed to have giant cell arthritis 11 years ago. And I still take steroid. And in my study- I agree with that. I'm doing fine. And in my study, I found, for example, there were patient who I tapered gradually to one milligram of prednisone for about three years, she was on one milligram prednisone. I said, I'll just stop it because people would think one milligram prednisone for three years is more than enough. And her ESR CRP went immediately sky high. I again put her on high dose steroid, controlled it, tapered to one milligram, and then for two, three years, kept on that. Again, when I stopped, uh, these ESR and CRP went up. I tried that about two, three times. And I tried that in 10 women, 10 patients with Janssen arthritis. Everybody behaved the same. So that way, for example, I have told my rheumatologist, I'll stay on one milligram. And I'm on one milligram. So it is actually a Janssen arthritis is a lifelong disease because there, there are patients, the one study, they did 
temporary biopsy 10 years after the initial treatment with steroid. And it was temporary biopsy was positive. So disease is there, it doesn't die. And you have to keep it controlled. And I found the very low dose, one to five milligram can control it without any having side effect. As I said, I'm sitting in front of you. I've been on steroid for the last 10 years. And I'm still talking. Yes, and very well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so, well, professor. This is a rheumatologist and ophthalmologist have a different idea about giant cell arthritis. Because rheumatologists mostly deal with polymyalgia rheumatica and with the aches and pain. As ophthalmologists, we deal with a blinding disease, which is a very serious. And rheumatologists say dancer arthritis burn itself out in two years. I haven't found that at all. As I said, I have had 300 patients with dancer arthritis. That is not true at all. So, and our patient with dancer arthritis being treated by rheumatologists, after two years they stop, they do a dancer arthritis and went blind. When the patient go blind, they send it to the ophthalmologist. They don't manage that. So that's where the whole concept of Janssen arthritis is different because they think Janssen arthritis is not a two year and you're done. Whereas ophthalmologist, you want to prevent people from going blind. And a person who has lost eye vision in one eye, you tell him or her that after two years going to stop the treatment. And nobody is going to be willing to take a risk of losing the second eye. So that's the difference between who is treating the answer arthritis. As I said, I have told my rheumatologist I'll stay on one milligram for the rest of my life. It's not doing me any harm. So I found four or five milligram for the rest of the life has no side effects at all. Okay, thank you, doctor. Uh, it's a, it, it was a great pleasure to have you again with us. It was also historical because uh, we know that, that you have to struggle alone with all of these things and concepts and we, we read your letters to the editor and everything that you say is, is well funded and we, we have to thank you only and, and we are grateful to have you here. Okay, I think we all agree with that. Thank you. Thank you indeed for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. It was enlightening, that's the word. It was enlightening. It was very educating. Thank you for, for being so generous and sharing all your knowledge with us. I hope I have not uh, upset your ophthalmologist. Yes. Okay. Yes, we are. I, I am a retinologist, but... Uh... <laughs> okay, so, uh, Professor, I will make a statement in, in Spanish and then we close the, this uh, session, okay? Eh, gracias a todos por eh, haber estado con nosotros. Eh, esta charla la van a encontrar en YouTube, la van a encontrar también en Instagram en unos días para consulta y, bueno... Eh, también queda agradecerles a todos por, por haber estado con nosotros y haber hecho las preguntas eh, también pueden encontrar el resto de, nuestros, de nuestras conferencias y, 
y actualizaciones en, en el canal de YouTube. Eh, y bueno, les agradecemos de nuevo. Thank you, professor. Thank you, professor Ebner and, and Dolores, to, to having been with us today. And, and we hope to repeat this uh, in the future uh, with another with another session, an interesting session and historical session with Professor Harry. Thank you.